begin to be talking about Latin America. So if we could get Victor on the line, please. Good morning. Yeah, hi, James, and thank you for inviting me to your show. Um, as a way of an introduction, and you can see on, on the slide, my name is Victor Sabo, and I'm investment director in the emerging market debt team of Aberdeen. And I look after the fixed income allocation within the Aberdeen Latin American Income Fund. Uh, I have a few slides. Yep. Here we go. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so just a big picture. So the fund has double objective is to provide capital growth and also to pay a steady stream of dividends to shareholders through investing in LATAM equities and fixed income securities. Uh, so it's a combination uh, of, of both asset classes. And as you can see, probably the, the first is what is LATAM? I mean, obviously, uh, your listeners should be well aware, but just to give you a snapshot, we are talking about uh, a large and vibrant region combining many different countries. Uh, and the fund is currently invested in seven countries in the region. These are the ones which have the, the most deep and liquid capital markets. Obviously, we are avoiding some of the uh, more unstable or hairy uh, countries in the region. Uh, these are quite stable uh, markets. And this is Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, Peru, Uruguay, and Argentina. Um, if you look at the, these countries, they have a combined population of close to 500 million people uh, that, that exceeds the total population of the European Union. And also it is a region with a much younger population. So the median age would be below 32 years. And that's 12 years lower than that of the EU median uh, age. So we have a kind of young and vibrant region with, with a rising middle class, which still uh, represents a quite, quite important theme when we talk about investments. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, well, first of all, the, the kind of asset allocation breakdown, 64% uh, is invested in equities and 36% in bonds. Um, it would not be surprising that the fixed income allocation is responsible for the majority of the income generation. Uh, while the equities are more capped for uh, capital growth appreciation. We have uh, leverage on the fund, roughly now 14% gross leverage. And in terms of geographic breakdown, it reflects the size and the deepness of the local equity and debt markets. So probably you wouldn't be surprised to see that uh, Brazil represents uh, almost half of, of, the of the combined allocation. Uh, with Mexico being the, the second largest, and then Colombia, Uruguay, Peru, Chile, and just a small allocation to Argentina, uh, which is actually in, in, in a company, uh, in a software company, which derives most of its income from, from the US and other parts of Latin, not, not necessarily Argentina. Um, so the, some key information about uh, the fund. Uh, it pays quarterly dividends, um, has, has been paying, uh, has maintained the, the same level of dividends over the last five years. Uh, using the end of February prices, the net dividend yield was just shy of 7%. Uh, if you look at the current valuations, that would be somewhat lower than that. Uh, the fund is trading at a discount to its net asset value. Uh, as you can see, it has been 13.7% uh, at the end of February. Um, now it's below 11%, but generally the discount level has been quite stable over the years, around 12%. Um, and although we don't have many competitors, but if you look at the, the similar funds in the UK, which invest in, in LATAM, LATAM equity, that we can say that's the general discount level, which we see for that region. Um, let's go into the next slide, just briefly on, on performance. Uh, we can say that 2020 and 21 has been quite difficult for that region. Uh, we had the pandemic, uh, which was materially negative. We had a lot of political noise um, and also global capital flows were not favoring the region. It, it, it was an unloved region. Uh, and not just what we saw everywhere that money was going into the US, but also in, within EM, uh, 
we saw people not really interested in, in putting money there. Um, we're seeing things starting to change now. Uh, performance has improved a lot. And if you look at this year, Latin markets and currencies, they outperformed other regions and not just in emerging markets, but also in, in developed markets. So something is, is really changing. Uh, and kind of on the next slide, just to thinking about um, why Latam and, and, and why now? Um, and most of that is kind of thinking on, on the equity side. Uh, well, first of all, the Latam is clearly benefiting from the, the rotation we're seeing globally from growth to value. And this is a region which has seen a significant improvement in the terms of trade, uh, thanks to the rising commodities prices. It is a region which is not directly exposed to the war in Ukraine like uh, many countries in, in our time zone. Uh, it is quite refreshing to speak about uh, LATAM. We spend so much time uh, discussing the, the implications of the war um, that it it's, it's really looks like a region with, with very limited and, and, and indirect uh, linkages to that. It is also less impacted directly by the zero COVID policy of China which is clearly a strong drag on, on growth in, in Asia. And focusing closer on, on the economies, uh, we're seeing gradual recovery. As I said, COVID was a big hit to the region, but now most economies have basically recovered to, to pre-COVID levels and, and continue to grow, not an exceptional pace, but I would rather say kind of a, a, a slow, decent uh, one. Uh, I mentioned already the, the technicals. <coughs> uh, we're now starting to see inflows into the, the region. Uh, looking at surveys, we still see that uh, global asset managers and funds are still underweight. The region have been for, for some time. So that is something which investors should keep in mind when thinking about the kind of technicals. Uh, Brazil has started to see uh, a boom of, of retail investors. Uh, previously, the, the equity, local equity market was dominated by kind of the local hedge funds and international players. And that's an interesting change that during COVID, many people, as probably as far in the world, have started to, to dive into uh, direct investing into, into local equities. Um, and also, it's worth mentioning that uh, we can have an exposure to high quality companies in underpenetrated sectors. Uh, a lot of these are in, not in the benchmark and we have quite a big flexibility to, to play around and, and look at other names. So not just hugging the, the benchmark. And another thing, if you go to the next slide, what we can mention is that uh, typically LATAM uh, has been a dividend paying uh, region. If we compare, you can see on the slide with, uh, with other region and it covers uh, quite a long time period. You can see that significant part of the income has been coming from, from dividends and the pandemic has not materially curtailed the company's ability to, to pay out dividends. If anything, we have seen some improvement in the uh, operating margins and some cost discipline and so on the next slide, uh, I think it is important to highlight a few key themes because there's quite often a misconception about Latin America that it's kind of pure commodity play. Uh, and indeed, if, if you look at kind of macro numbers, large part of investments in the middle of the last decade has indeed materialized in extractive sectors. But if you look at Latin nowadays, it's much, much more than, than, than a pure commodity play. Uh, and some of the key investment themes uh, you can see there, um, just to, to name a few, uh, the aspiration, uh, I mentioned you know, the rising middle classes who want to have access to better services, um, healthcare, transportation, fashion are, are among the, the key themes there. Uh, digitalization is happening. I mean, there's some really exciting uh, market and off-market opportunities. Uh, E-commerce has been spreading fast. Uh, we have some nice FinTech companies 
both startups and now more mature companies and technology as well. Uh, we have significant allocation into the greening theme, uh, clearly renewable energy uh, has been spreading in, in the region and there are some best in class producers of key commodities which are needing which are needed to transition to, to, to greener economy and uh, electrify. Uh, we also invest in tech, enab tech enablers uh, which kind of offer opportunities in the technology space. Uh, there are some kind of old school infrastructure development needs as well uh, where we have some players and probably the, the largest allocation thematic allocation in the fund would be into financial services uh, expansion uh, the penetration of financial services in the region is still increasing it has a scope to further increase uh, as well as we are observing the deepening of the capital markets uh, the next slide shows a few examples of, of these key themes um, I wouldn't go uh, through them one by one, uh, especially that I'm, I'm on the fixed income side, not on the equity side, but some of those <coughs> sorry names would be, I think, quite familiar to, uh, to anyone who is following the equity market. Um, and one thought on the valuation. So as I said, LATAM has been an unloved region and we clearly see that in, in, in the price performance and not just because it did so bad during COVID. Uh, last year, we also had some political noise, which was clearly overpriced by the market. Now kind of, we, we see it exposed that the, the risk premium was exaggerated. Um, and as a result, we see uh, LATAM, so if we look at the MSCI EM, uh, forward P ratios, uh, there is a significant discount. If you look at its, compared to its 10 year average, then we have over 30% discount. But even if you compare to the emerging market average, and you can see here the um, MSCI EM, uh, there is a 27% discount to, to the EM uh, average. And if you dive into individual markets, all of the LATAM markets are now trading much cheaper on the forward P basis compared to their 10% average uh, with the discounts between 12 and 36% uh, across all the countries. And maybe just one last thought on, on the macro, uh, same as in other regions of the world, LATAM has also seen a, a big spike in inflation um, the background is the same as everywhere else, that we had a significant demand side stimulus um, you, during the pandemic, and that is combined with significant supply side problems, um, including all the supply chain disruptions and also the commodity price increases, obviously aggravated by the, 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 the war in Ukraine. Uh, the, the, the difference between LATAM and, and other regions is that here the central banks have start, started to react faster uh, and move more aggressively. So if you look at this chart, you can see that um, we started from a very low base which is during COVID uh, policy rates across the region were pushed to extremely low levels, to historic lows. Uh, and from that point on, the, the, the banks had to move. And kind of the, the middle, so the gray part of the bar shows you uh, what interest rate hikes have already been delivered by the central banks. And the kind of top shows how much more is priced in. And you can see that kind of in Brazil and Chile and Peru, uh, most of the heavy lifting is already done. Most of the rate hikes are behind us. There's still some little more left to deliver. Uh, Colombia, Mexico is more kind of in, in the middle of the cycle and we can even say Colombia is a bit behind the curve, um, but they, they, they will be catching up soon as well. Why, why it is important? Uh, because of the carry, uh, because 
these currencies are now looking much more attractive because the obviously the rate hiking has not really started in, in developed markets. And uh, although the Fed is now pricing in significant uh, hikes, but still the interest rate differential remains ginormous. And I think that is one of the main explanations why we have seen such a stellar performance from emerging market current from LATAM currencies uh, this year. I mean, if you look and against the sterling, then BRL is up 26%, you know, Uruguay peso 18%, uh, Colombian peso 14%. So all, all these have strong, strong performance. Um, and as I said, the carry is a key factor, also kind of the, the improved terms of trades, the no linkages to, to the war uh, in Ukraine, and also the kind of the, the underinvestment, underinvested status of the region and the changing capital flows. Uh, I think I'll stop here and happy to take uh, any questions or comments. Um, first one then for me, then. I think given those sort of hikes in uh, rates, what's that done to yields on the fixed interest part of the portfolio? Yeah, yields have, have gone up quite a lot, quite dramatically. I mean, in, like in, in Brazil, basically doubled, if you look at the kind of long end of the curve. So we have now yields around 10, 12% in, in some countries of, of the region. I mean, the, the, the way we played that game is that we, we, we try to uh, have lower duration than we typically have. And also we try to hide in inflation linked bonds uh, waiting for the opportunity to, to actually add duration. And we are starting to do that now in selective markets where we think sufficient rate hikes are priced in and um, inflation is around peaking. And this is the region where actually inflation will peak earlier than in other parts of the emerging markets. We are starting to, to adding back duration because the level is just, just really super attractive. It's difficult to call exactly what, what are they, what, when, when will be the, the, the bottom of the fixed income markets, but it has moved a lot. Okay, cool. Um, if we go back to the um, split, where are we? It was... Yeah. Yeah. So what, was, what did you say the proportion was between uh, equities and fixed income? I think I didn't work it out there. But... So currently 64% in equities. The, I mean, to simplify, you can say one third in bonds and, and thirds in equities. Okay. And then what's the sort of interest gap, interest rate gap between the, what you're paying in your debt and what you're earning on the fixed income? That's a good question. I mean, currently Roughly. we are under earning, but we are close to, to actually matching. Uh, in terms of the, uh, the the income generation and the the leverage is in sterling, if that was the question, okay, uh, which is still quite low. Um, I think it, it's below two percent, and the average yield we are getting on on the bond portfolio is around eight percent. Obviously, you have to take into account the currency mismatch. Um, because the leverage is in sterling, that's the base currency of the fund, and all the assets are invested in LATAM currencies, which obviously has the impact that when the uh, LATAM currencies do well versus the sterling, that amplifies positive performance. And when, uh, if the sterling is outperforming the LATAM currencies, that is a detractor to performance. Okay, fair enough. And then essentially, do you always run it in such a way that the, the equity part is essentially ungeared? And so the fixed income is always bigger than the debt? Yeah, I mean, we, we have a, a limit on, on how much debt we, we take on. We, we wouldn't go above 20%. That's kind of our internal cap. Um, so as I said, we, we are now around 14%. Okay. So what sort of drives the gearing level? What, 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 what's the, how does the decision-making work? Uh, well, clearly the, the gearing is there to, to help uh, generate the income. Uh, and kind of looking at the long-term valuation, when you think the markets are cheapish, then, then you have higher leverage. 
when you're kind of more risk averse and you think that kind of valuations have gone far, then then you you reduce the the leverage. Uh, obviously, that's not the the prime tool you you kind of jump around <laughs> with. Uh, if if any, like our first kind of decision is more about the the asset allocation. So depending on where we are in the economic cycle, uh, we move the allocation between equities and, and fixed income. And this now, you, the allocation you see now is reflective of a, a recovering economy. So typically when you have uh, a recovering economy, then equities are doing better than, than the fixed income, especially in the inflationary environment. So that's why you know, we have probably lower allocation to fixed income than we had uh, in the past few years. Um, so if we continue to see strong equity performance, then at some point we might decide to, to add more to, to fixed income. But for now, uh, we, are, we are running compared to the, we have kind of an indicative benchmark allocation, 60% equities, 40% bonds. So we are, compared to that is where overweight equities and underweight the fixed income. Okay, cool. Um, so in terms of the, the sort of portfolio management, um, how many people have you got working on this kind of strategy? And is it is a completely different team doing the debt and doing the FT? Yes, it's an interesting product because it has two teams, two quite large teams working together on it. And the individual sleeve, so the equity sleeve and fixed income sleeve is the responsibility of each individual team. And then we regularly come together to discuss the, the relative valuation. So where, where we see more opportunities in, in the equity space or in, in the fixed income space. Uh, it helps that we have an office in Sao Paulo uh, where we have quite a few equities people looking uh, on the Brazilian market and more broadly on the regional market. So they have kind of first-hand access to, to all the companies. And it's, <coughs> sorry, it's, it helps not just when it comes to investments, but also comes when we are talking about engagement with company and uh, raising ESG issues because they play quite an active role in uh, pushing the companies towards better governance. Okay, thank you. Um, within these sort of markets, is there only one of them that's sort of better in terms of delivering yield on the equity portfolio than the others? Uh, I think Chile has been paying somewhat higher dividends um, compared to the rest, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's more sector-specific rather than, than country-specific. Okay. Um, and then in terms of that, the, the equity income, I'm, presu I'm assuming you saw the same dip in dividends that we had in, in the rest of the world. Has, have they now all recovered or is there still more to come in terms of um, equity income growing? The majority has recovered, but as I said, for, for this particular fund, the majority of the, the income is coming from, from the fixed income side. So we are not targeting specifically dividend, like high dividend paying companies. Uh, our equity portfolio is pretty similar to what we have in our uh, normal regional LATAM equity portfolios, uh, which is so no need to, to, to divert from that. It's still the, the best ideas. We're not forcing income generation requirement on, on, on this uh, fund, so it's more kind of the fixed income part, which which yeah. is important. Okay. So, what sort of yield do you get on the equity portion? Do you think? Uh, I think it will be quite low, around three percentage. Okay. Cool. That makes sense. Good. Um, in terms of this sort of split here by country, is that determined by the the stocks you like, or are you thinking about a split of the benchmark as well? It's more bottom up. So it's more kind of the, the best ideas. Uh, and obviously kind of you, you have to be aware of what's in a benchmark. But as I said, there's a lot of smaller companies which are not necessarily present. Um, so we, we kind of do have 
differences in, in, in regions and, and in, in sector allocations as well. But the, the whole investment process works from bottom up. So we're looking first at the companies, we're looking at, at how well they're run, what, 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 what's the, the business idea, uh, how, how well, uh, what we think about the management of the company. Uh, we don't invest typically in the companies uh, without having visited them multiple times. So we need to have the certainty that the companies we invest in are, uh, are really good. Um, obviously, it's a bit more challenging when it comes to, to new sectors like e-commerce, where the companies don't have a long, long, long track record. Uh, but still, uh, kind of w we are not jumping on, on just purely ideas. We want to have a, a substantiated business model and, and good revenue generation abilities from the companies uh, before investing. Okay. Um, can you just explain a little bit more about what the aspiration theme is, please? Yeah, sure. I mean, this, as I said, the, and we have seen it in, in, in other regions as well, that as the economies develop and as the, the middle class grows, it has the desire to, to have uh, better services, uh, and particular, you know, healthcare was would be one of them. And I think we all have the desire to uh, to, to better service. And the public services are quite often not up to the job. Uh, so, that, so they are private providers who are able to to cover the gap. Um, and also, uh, fashion is is another quite quite big and dynamic uh, segment of the market. Uh, we have seen some uh, companies there. Uh, retail in general, those companies which can actually address the, the needs of, um, of the consumer, um, those, they, they would be attractive. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically the, the rising middle class theme that, is, that, that has been and, and continues to be uh, one of the key elements in that term. Okay, thank you. Um, I suppose part of the reason that uh, Latin America is doing better is because of the sort of commodity price rises. So, so it's a good alternative source of things like food and uh, minerals and things. And also, I'm guessing that most of these countries are net energy exporters. But, but, but is any of that kind of reflected in the portfolio? This kind of commodity aspect? Uh, obviously, kind of, we, we, you, you cannot avoid commodities when, when you invest in Latin just purely because uh, so big part of the market is, is commodity. I mean, if, if you think of the largest companies like Petrobras, uh, definitely they, they would be uh, one of the key players. So yeah, we, we, we have exposure there, but it's not the dominant theme. And the reason is that because we don't like investing in companies where government intervention can be a risk. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of those sectors in LATAM, but also in other parts of, of EM, we see either direct government ownership or influence as a regulator. Um, and obviously with, with rising energy prices, the commodities companies themselves can come under pressure if the countries are to apply uh, price caps, which fortunately has not happened really that much in that region, although we have seen it in other parts of, of EM, but there is clearly political pressure and we see it constantly, for example, in, in, in Brazil, uh, the, the desire to, to intervene into the kind of market pricing and, and have some, uh, some, some kind of, of caps, um, and instead of kind of subsidizing the consumer, hurting the, the, the company. So that's why kind of we, we, we don't like to think about LATAM as, as, as dominantly an, uh, an energy play. We just don't want to, to confront, to get in confrontation kind of with, uh, with government intervention. Sure. Okay. That makes sense. <clears throat> but in terms of the, the um, renewable energy bit, the green bit here, um, are, are, are those renewable energy generation companies or are they, they making the sort of kit and stuff? Uh, both. Uh, 
but far as I'm aware, it's it's it, it's basically the, the the whole the whole chain. Um, and what is more important, probably, is, is not just the the, pre, the producers, but more the the companies which serve them, which provide the equipment for uh, extracting those uh, metals, which are are really important, or kind of provide the the the, the other services needed. Okay, cool. I mean, there are some interesting companies here, definitely. I mean, things like Mercado Libre, I know Ed has made a lot of money out of. Um, so, um, have you got sort of a, a favourite? What, what are our largest holdings, actually? Uh, probably got that on the fact sheet. Uh, yeah. Totals would be la largest, and Arezzo, Arca Continental, Oma, Multiplan, Grupo Mexicar, Rodespar, Reina, Ryzen, and Club in Unit, just at the top 10. Okay. Is it a fairly concentrated uh, portfolio? Um, sorry? Is it a fairly concentrated portfolio? Uh, relatively, yes, because the, the top 10 holding give 30% of the, the equity part. I mean, if, if you look at the benchmark weight of our top 10 holding, that would be just 5%. So yes, we, we do take quite quite large bets on kind of high conviction companies. Okay, cool. Um, there's lots of questions about sort of politics and things. Uh, maybe we should deal with that briefly. I mean, how do you factor in things like elections coming up and um, what's going on in the US and the attitudes to, to Latin America and the US. How do you, does that sort of play out in the portfolio? Yeah, I mean, clearly politics ha has an influence on pricing. And as I said, it has probably more influence than, than justified. Last year, we have seen a complete destruction of the Peruvian and the Chilean markets, uh, both equities and, and, and fixed income and, and, and the currency. And <clears throat> looking back now, it, it quite, quite clearly was, was overdue. But the big picture is that uh, we, we came into the, the pandemic with mostly right-wing governments, and they have clearly mismanaged the pandemic. Um, we have seen in, in many countries kind of slow vaccination rollout, high levels of that, the healthcare really under stress. Um, although a lot of kind of help was provided on, on, on the fiscal and monetary policy side, still we can say that they, they haven't done their best. And unsurprisingly, we are seeing now swing to the left, which always a worry for, for the markets. We are always afraid that, okay, uh, what if leftist governments come in? What can they do? Uh, will they interfere with the energy sector? You know, will they nationalize? But uh, most of these fears are really overblown. Uh, we are not seeing that happening. Uh, in Peru, we had Pedro Castillo, quite a clearly a left-wing president elected. Um, he had, during the election campaign, some, um, some not really market-friendly comments, but has he been able to do anything? Not really. Uh, he's now to his fourth cabinet. Um, I think he already had churned through a couple of dozen ministers. Um, none of his really populist agenda is going through. Um, so yes, yeah, some, some political instability, which is not great for the sentiment, but in terms of what effectively came out of it, uh, you know, the change in, in potential change in constitution and so on, nothing has really materialized. Uh, same in Chile was a long election process with Gabriel Boric coming out, but what <laughs> Sorry, once again, what we're seeing from him is much more moderate uh, policies. The, the appointments he made, uh, people are, are quite well regarded in terms of the kind of economic credentials. Um, and we can s expect policy continuity. Uh, they still have the consultation on the new constitution. So it will be quite interesting to see what will come out of it. Once again, it looks like uh, left-leaning constitutional assembly. We are seeing in the newspapers articles about some quite extreme proposals, but at the end of the day, they will have to have a consensus on uh, on everything. So they will end up, I think, with a with a 
much more balanced and uh, market friendly constitution, but also addressing some of the long term underlying issues, you know, about the access to water, about the kind of distribution of natural resources. But I don't think any of this would seriously undermine the investments, uh, the large investments we have seen in, in, the, in these countries. Um, and especially Chile is benefiting from, from being uh, one of the main producers of copper, which is quite important in the with greenery electrification. Um, we have election in presidential election in Colombia at the end of May. That's quite interesting because uh, Gustavo Petro, who currently leads the polls, probably the most left wing <laughs> of all these people I mentioned before. So even more to the left to, to Castillo and, and Boric. But we're seeing that Federico Gutierrez, who is a conservative candidate, is, is started to, to, to gain traction. So what it seemed to be a, a quite clear victory for Petro is no longer is. So it will be quite interesting to see. Uh, once again, we had um, kind of campaign promises about you know, nationalizing the, um, the, the oil sector, but given kind of the, the, the economy of, of the country, uh, Petro just simply couldn't afford to, uh, to not have that income, which currently is provided by that sector. And probably the, the biggest election for this year in the region is in Brazil, uh, late in the year. Uh, it looks like uh, a runoff between Bolsonaro and Lula. I mean, unlike in the previous elections, we have two candidates with whom we are pretty much familiar with. So it's kind of the choosing between the devils, you know, uh, not great choice either from a market perspective. But uh, I mean, if you look through the political noise, you have to see that Brazil has done quite a bit of structural reforms, kicking and screaming, but that has happened, you know, on the constitutional spending cap. Uh, you know, the labor market reform, the sanitation reform, these are things which are coming through, not as fast as we would like. Uh, and there's still a, a lot of reform, structural reforms being discussed at the Congress, you know, the, administ the administrative reform, tax reforms, uh, which are obviously not going to happen before the election, but probably after the election will happen. And just to remind you, in 2002, before Lula was elected, the markets were completely freaked out that, okay, we have a, a leftist coming to power. And probably the, the first term of the dual administration was one of the best periods for, for Brazil. Uh, I mean, obviously it coincided with, with the commodity super cycle, but still, um, and that was kind of the second term where uh, kind of all, all, all the deeper uh, corruption issues were uh, Kind of started to, uh, to to infiltrate the the economy, but then uh, Lula he he selected Gerardo Alckmin as a running mate, which is clear indication that he is not willing to to pull to the extremes. Uh, he's more governing kind of his campaign towards the the center, uh, unlike the his party, the, the the Workers' Party, the PT, which still has quite populist comments. But Lula has been quite disciplined in in not going into into populism. Uh, unlike he, his his party does, so yeah. Then uh, looking from from a side, from outside, we can say that the quality of of the presidents, and here you can add uh, Mexico's president AMLO, who has been kind of minor disaster for the country, but was uh, kind of confirmed that at, at the recall referendum recently, not the best quality, but they are not destroying their countries in, in a way that kind of we see in, in, in some other countries. Well, um, actually, you, know, you, you, you can think these, about that as well. That, yeah, with these companies that are in the portfolio, how sensitive are they to, to what's going on in the politi political world anyway? Or are they just driven by the, the rest of the stuff that's, that's, that's hard to change, like demographics? Uh, indirectly, obviously. I mean, through kind of the general risk sentiment, if, if you have kind of a big political turmoil that has a negative impact on, on business sentiment that has negative impact on growth. But directly, we are keeping away from companies which have, as I mentioned in, in for the commodities companies, which have direct linkages uh, to, to governments and or are at high risk of regulatory changes. 
um, also like an education sector would be typical, typically one of those where where you, you just cannot know when when, when things uh, change on, on on the regulatory side. So we focus on the companies which are much more market based and are not relying on on government contracts, uh, not relying, not not really at risk of of, of changing regulation. So that, that that's kind of how we approach that political risk. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, is there anything you can do to make the fund bigger? That's a good question. Yes, it, it is a relatively small fund. Um, I mean, first of all, probably you, you need to, to have more attractiveness of the, of the region, I guess. Uh, it hasn't been really on, on people's focus, despite valuations being <coughs> super cheap compared to, to other <coughs> parts of, of, of EM and, and DM. So it, it is really difficult. Uh, and we're kind of constantly talking with, uh, with, with family offices and, and other investors uh, to, 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 make it, uh, to provide some interest. Uh, but yeah, I think looking from, from the, the UK, LATAM hasn't been really uh, in, in favor. Uh, one thing actually we, we are doing, given the, the small size of the, of the fund, is that we are keeping the, the costs capped. Uh, so a, any cost which is above 2% uh, is covered by Aberdeen. Uh, so that, that's just to offset the, uh, that issue for investors that a small fund typically has a high cost ratio. Yeah, I think that's important, actually. Good. All right. I think we've, we've covered an awful lot of ground there. Thanks very much, Victor. Um, well, thank you, James. And um, good luck with it all. And hopefully um, it's Latam's time. So we'll see. <laughs> Looks like. Good. All right. And so thanks for everybody to, uh, who tuned in. We will obviously um, be back next week. Uh, and we'll be talking to the manager of a uh, new a new issue, Foresight and Sustainable Forestry. And then an old favourite is coming to talk to us on the 6th of May. So we've got Momentum and Multicase Value, used to be Centre for Income and Growth. And obviously we're going to have Andrew Patti around as well. So um, good to talk to you again, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you.